Welcome to the Lost Rewatch. I'm very excited today. Not only are we talking about Exodus Parts 1, 2, and 3, I have two of the most talented people in the world oh, stop. joining me Ooh. today. Josh Wiggler and Mike Bloom. How's it going, guys? Small, small world in your case, but you know what? That's much like Sawyer says to Jack. It's a small world of Lost as well, so it's very fitting that we're here in that case. Small world, isn't it? Oh, my gosh. Well, yeah. I'm just fresh from uh, my shirt was off. I was chopping some trees in the jungle. Uh, and my tree was off, and I was chopping some shirts. So yeah. really, we're, we're fitting wow. into each other now. We're very <laughs> simpatico in that way, yeah, Mike exactly. Bloom and I. Yeah, very complimentary. And I, was, and I wasn't doing anything. <laughs> I, I, just, just call, just call me. Uh, you can call me Shannon. I guess. I guess. Oh, Fair enough. Oh. <laughs> we we just came from uh, covering Hearts and Minds on our respective rewatch podcast, and we had a listener submit a very comprehensive, very detailed, and very very well written dissertation in defense of Shannon. So, yes. oh, I, haven't got, I, haven't, I haven't got to that part yet. So, I guess I'll have to uh, go back and listen again. I, I don't like to criticize anybody on the show, really. I guess, but. She didn't really do much in the first season. Uh, I, yeah, I think that that's true. And then she didn't really do a ton. And I, how how spoilery are we allowed to be here? Do what say whatever. Yeah, you well, can then say. she doesn't do much in the second season or the rest of the show either, because she's about to die. Uh, yeah. So I, I feel like actually what we're talking about in today's episode. I mean, leading off with Shannon is maybe not the headline of Exodus, but this is probably like the best Shannon episode in in some ways. I feel like everything that's going on with her. By Mike Bloom. <laughs> well, that was quick. He gave up quick. <laughs> what if that was it? That would, <laughs> just post that to your YouTube channel. Yeah. I think that, that would be. Uh... You know what? Maybe I'll leave this in, and that'll be the teaser. Oh my God, that's good. Yeah, it's like a great. Uh, uh, it's like the it's the version of your podcast. Uh, What's in the hatch? Uh, yeah. Who who is opening the door in the Bloom right. household? Oh my God! I gotta leave the room. Yeah, that's it. That's it. He's got to go back down the hatch. Oh man, uh, it was great. I'm I'm so thankful that you have us on for for this episode. I think when Mike gets back on here, he'll probably say the same thing that uh, this is. Uh, he and I have both agreed that this is our favorite episode of the show. Uh, and like going it's, through it's, like going through like some of the earlier stuff now, like because we have we obviously we're we're like half half a season behind you at this point um like we've gone through so many like really great episodes so far so like that's been like kind of like challenging that notion of like is exodus really the best episode and like i kind of feel that way again after having watched it uh the like well, all, you, there's so many great sequences in this one well you have the pilot which is near perfect yeah exactly you, you have you have walkabout you have the constant which is 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 excellent but this one like i said it's been four years since i've watched it yeah, and and I I it's I've been saying this whole time. I remember the scenes, but I, I forget the the episode they're in. A lot of it, and I go, this was this was perfect. Yeah, it I mean, it, it pulls at your heart. I mean, it just the raft it, launch is just. Yeah, one, I think the raft launch is the best scene in Lost. Um, I think like the and, and like juxtaposing that against. Uh, Walt getting taken is like one of the yeah. one of like the most severely screwed up scenes in the entire show. We also get Claire's first "My baby" I, and also <laughs> and also the the real the real. Uh, Whoa! I know. Oh my god! So the so the next one we're up to on on the podcast is the Michael episode. Uh, okay. And so I watched it today just because uh, we record on Tuesdays and I was able to, to to watch it today to take all my notes and everything. And I was laughing so hard. I forgot how quickly like they really do. Even now, like they get into the wall, the wall, like the yeah. first like scene of the episode is Michael just running around being like, wall. Yeah. You can't stop. It's, it's such a great show and it has so many. Well, this one had so many, you know, uh, phrases that are. You know, you you always remember them. You know, you have arts on you, and oh, you got God, some arts yeah. on you. It just it just is just classic, and it just uh, like I said, yeah, I agree. It's it, I don't know if it's my favorite, but it, it's definitely up there. I was just I remember I I don't know that I had ever had anticipation for an episode of television the way that I did for Exodus because like I had been so hooked in by the rest of the season, and so this was you know this is the first season finale. Everything's building up for the hatch you know that you've got at least a summer before you're going to get any kind of, you know, further momentum behind whatever they were going to reveal to you in the finale. I think by the time they aired it, they had already 
they they aired it across two weeks, right? Like they did the first part and then the the two part. I think was the next week. You see, I don't know because we Jay and I watched it. We didn't watch Lost until after the the DVDs came out. Yeah. When did you and start? See, we started uh, podcasting. Yeah. Season two. Yeah. We started, but it was uh, we. I think we had like two weeks to go. Because I said, there's no way we're going to be able to finish this show. It's like 20-something episodes. I said, there's right. no way. And like I said, I think the first day we watched 12. Yeah. Tw- we went through 12 straight. And then yeah. the next day, that's a, that's and we, fin- we finished. I think it was like 3 or 4 in the morning. I said, well, we got to find out what's in the hatch. Yeah. And then uh, you don't find out what's in the hatch. You're like, come on. I know. <laughs> we we, we only was, had to wait two uh, weeks. They it, waited, what, six, seven months. It was it was excruciating uh in in real time like that was awful it really was but the, but what was great about that was i i found myself because then i got the dvds after you know after season one finished I forget when they came out that would actually be good to know when did when did the lost season one dvd did they have like a release date anywhere online because i remember it came out and then i was uh i was going back to college that summer uh, and one of my really close friends who had not watched the show yet, um, was, we were going to be housemates. We were moving into a house with a bunch of our other friends and he, uh, like me and all of my roommates, uh, from, from the year before watched season one together. It was like our dorm room experience. Right. And then this friend was going to be moving into our house with us. Uh, and he hadn't watched it cause he wasn't in the dorm room. I was like, all right, well, you're not going to be able to live with us unless <laughs> like you sign off on the fact that like, I think it was Wednesday nights, like Wednesday nights are a holy night of the week. Uh, and you cannot talk during anything. You can talk during commercials. The commercials are done and you have to shut up. Uh, and like, you need to get on board. Otherwise you're, we're going to have to kick you out and you're still going to have to pay your rent. Um, so I, <laughs> so I had the, I had the DVDs and I gave them to, to him. And I was like, just watch it. Uh, cause like we'd hung out at some point over the summer. I was like, watch it. Um, I think, no, I think we had, we had just gotten back to school the semester was about to start up. We were probably like two weeks away from the semester beginning. And I gave him the DVDs. I was like, whenever you want to watch this, let me know. We can watch the first episode. And you've got like two or three weeks before season two starts back up. Uh, and he was like done in two days. And yeah. I felt like that that was like a really common story. And I felt like there was sort of this feeling of like you could li- you could lend out the the DVDs to people uh, throughout the throughout that summer off. Well, um, you couldn't you couldn't stop watching it. Yeah, you really could. That's just how it was with us. I mean, I was like, well, okay, one more. Yeah, one yeah, more. Exactly, one more. And it's like, yeah. okay, I got to get some sleep. Well, I I think what's interesting is that like this is one of the best Shannon episodes. Uh, yeah, because she becomes Vincent's caretaker. Uh, she has like the great scene with Claire of like, do we deserve this? Uh, yes. But like, that's just like one shade of the like five thousand reasons why Exodus uh, is so awesome. Such a freaking color palette yeah, and great. i i personally feel like this is lost at its best uh you know granted it does have three hours of real estate uh as opposed to some other very cr- uh, renowned episodes only have one hour to work with but it really shows how you know each character sort of gets their time in the sun or the gin uh as it were <laughs> to just sort of highlight you know this is what are. i deal with every week <laughs> I, I, I've podcasted with him before. Yeah, I, I know. I know. Exactly. <laughs> I was say, you know like, the score. Uh, you both are in the shared misery of dealing And I with love how I'm saying that as if I'm not guilty of the same crime. Yeah. Exactly. Look at to... when you're pointing, Josh, four <laughs> fingers are pointing back at you. I hope you know that. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think that it's it's a great highlight of each and every member of this ensemble, how we've gotten to know them over flashbacks over the course of this season. It's also been super interesting revisiting Exodus, how much material they sort of uh, regurgitate for us. Like the the Kate inter the Kate scene the Kate flashback scene with Edward Mars is so interesting to me because the Marshal just goes through like everything we know about Kate up to this point, uh, which you know at this point maybe some people are tuning in just for the season finale. Maybe they still need to get that information out there. But it is interesting how totally some, yeah some cases they've used it as like a, a review of who these characters are. I had a I had a friend who wasn't watching Lost, and uh, so so. I, I was in college when when Lost debuted. Uh, it was my sophomore year. I came back and the finale was airing, I think, like a week or so after I had come home. And I had a very close friend who had not been into Lost yet. I was like, come over and watch the episode. It doesn't matter. You just got to watch it. And like he he came by 
And I felt like the episode like laid out so much uh, already in like that first uh, in like the previously on yeah. the first hour really sets up what the stakes are. It's not that hard of a leap to understand that these people are on a crazy island that they're trying to get off. People are actively getting off the island in the episode. So there's just like sort of like this intense forward momentum, even though the the finale of season one is such a great build up to everything else that season one is all about. And it caps that off so beautifully. It almost one of the underrated qualities about it. I think it's a really great selling point for people who've like you've maybe heard that lost is this phenomenon at this point. Hmm. Why don't you jump on board now and see what it's all about? Uh, I feel like there's a quality about that where it almost serves as like a secondary pilot to some people. Now, did your friend say, Hey, why is the bald guy in a wheelchair? Uh, my friend, my friend was really hyped up about the monster. Uh, Cause like before, before he sat down, like I'd given him like the download of like the big broad strokes of what was important about season one so far, like laid out what we knew about the characters. Like, so that guy was paralyzed. And he's not paralyzed anymore. Cause the island's magic and it could do crazy shit. Uh, and I was like, then there's a monster somewhere in the jungle and nobody's seen it. No one knows what it is. And we think it's a dinosaur, but maybe, Maybe it's not. Uh, and maybe it's a robot. And we saw the, uh, you know, you see the wisps of smoke for the first time. This is the first right. episode where, like, you get yeah. smoke monster in your in your world, in your vernacular. And I remember he looked at me as soon as, like, the, the first uh, major smoke monster scene of Exodus. And he, like, turned to me very seriously. And he was like, they're in a computer simulation. They're all <laughs> they're all they're all trapped <laughs> inside a computer simulation. That's a nanobot robot. Uh, and I've solved Lost, and I'm so excited, and I'm just... I know Nanobot is a big theory. Yeah. Was Super, say, to be fair, your theory. friend was not too far from the mark, but this idea of, like, uh, much like the hit CGI series reboot of the <laughs> 90s, to have Lost be a reboot of reboot would be yeah, a crazy twist. It'd be wild. Do you think they went with this, that showing us the Smoke Monster and this episode because we had Rousseau with the Black Smoke? Yeah. Do you, think you think that was just kind of because I remember when I said, I go, that's got to have something to do with it. It's got to have something to do with it because, you know, we didn't know who the, she kept saying the others, the others. We had seen Ethan, and I think that's the only other we've we've seen so far, right? Yeah. And then, this. and then Mr. Friendly and everyone on the I mean, boat. Yeah. Oh, know. that's right. Yeah. By yeah, the end of the episode, anyway. Yeah. Right. So yeah. I, I know when I was watching, I'm thinking, okay, that black smoke, black smoke, smoky, black, it has to tie, it has to be tied in together. No. So. I don't know. I mean, for but for a while though, even after that moment, there was a lot of theorizing as to is the black is the smoke like? I mean, because this is also where Russo calls it the island security system, and so it's like, right. okay, are the others using the monster? Uh, you know, and then once we get to season three and the, the pylons of it all, you realize, oh no, no, it is quite the opposite. It has just very heavily guarded itself against the monster. The monster right. is, as Russo says, a security system for the island. The island does not equal the others. Right. Right. Um, but yeah, I thought I I don't know. I I remember seeing that billowing smoke from the first time, and I didn't have any major theories about it other than like, oh no, that's bad news for everybody. Like, oh god, get on that raft and get out of there quick. Rescue comes sooner. Um, I don't know. Exodus is a crazy episode. Uh. This is it's such a good episode. It is it is this three hour lost the movie epic mm. uh, of just so much happening. So many different storylines, even sort of like the 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 lower tier storylines are pretty exciting with Saeed and Charlie running through the jungle to track down Rousseau and Charlie having to reckon with the heroin addiction again when he sees the yeah. Mary statues. He gets the gunpowder in his head to cauterize the wound and just shows you like how far Charlie has come and what, you know, the types of physical abuse he's willing to sustain uh, for. To be uh, fair, this is a walk in the park compared to being hung from a tree. I think so. I mean, I think I think it's probably like if you have to choose, go for the cauterization. Yeah, would you rather? Would you rather? I think you go for the gunpowder treatment than uh than the than getting hanged by Ethan. Um, but like that sets up really nicely some of the stuff that he'll be willing to do later on down the line. Um, but like I think you think back on Exodus, and that's probably like the weakest subplot. Uh, that's the mark of a pretty strong episode to me because, you know, there's everything that's going on with the search for the Black Rock. And that was such a crazy reveal the first oh, time you ever I see the Black Rock. That. It was so, and I love how, like, 
uh, I'm trying to remember what the reaction was. Of course, Locke has a typical Wikipedia of like, oh, obviously a slave ship from Mozambique. Uh, Arse is like, oh yeah, obviously a tidal wave came and washed the ship on the shore. Uh-huh. Everyone else is understandably like, why is there a Spanish galleon in <laughs> the middle of the jungle? And, well, I think uh, Hur- Hurley says, he goes, how is this, something like, how is this possible? And, and Rousseau says, have you not been on the same right. island as me? <laughs> Something to that effect. It's like, you know, this there strange things happen on this. And yeah. they really were hitting us over the head with, I think, the whole X is with the, the island being different, the island being different through the entire episode. But, uh, yeah, I just, I, I, I agree. I, I love this episode. And there's so much, like you said, there's so much going on. There's the, even, like you said, even the subplots are interesting. It was sometimes, in, you know, sometimes it, not so much in Lost, but a lot of shows they go, okay, I, I could do without that part. There wasn't a part where I'm like going, okay, hurry up and finish this so we can get to the other part. Well, right. what I love about this is, I mean, there's so many great plot points. Uh, obviously, there's the raft launch and subsequent destruction of it. There is the, the kidnapping of Walt, which is still horrifying. And obviously, the opening of the hatch, R.A.P. Arse, all that. But it is so enriched in character. And that's why, in my opinion, and I know Josh agrees that this is probably always going to be my favorite episode of Lost because it it really is the show firing on all cylinders uh, where it really is highlighting this group of people. And even uh, though you're embroiled in all these tasks that they're meant to do, you have things like, you know, Sawyer and Michael bonding over Bob Marley on the raft. Uh, You have... You have Claire and, uh, and sh- you know, you have Son and Shannon talking about, as Jin spoke about with Son, like, I'm here being punished. You know, this is some sort of hellacious Dante-esque climb that I have to go through. You know, even 25 episodes in, they're still providing these really interesting character pairings, not to mention the official Man of Science, Man of Faith conversation, right, which right. is the thesis statement of two of the main characters of the show that is going to be the crux of the plot for the next five seasons. Yeah, this whole idea that Locke leaves Jack with at the end of that saying, uh, Jack says, I don't believe in destiny. And Locke saying, yes, you do. You just don't know it yet. That only gets more powerful and more resonant when you know the full scope of Lost. But even even in that moment, um, you you sense that Locke is right, even though he's been glaringly wrong already uh, at that point in the show. And so there's that there's that tension there of this guy who's like maybe a little bit of a lunatic the guy who's playing Operation with the dynamite that just <laughs> blew up the science teacher, and he's still got, like, this death wish about him. Uh, that This is not a person that you should be trusting fully, and yet you have eyes. Much like Locke says in White Rabbit, he's a meat and potatoes guy. He doesn't believe in magic, but he's seen the wonders of the island. Well, you as the viewer, you've seen not just what Locke has seen, but what everybody else has seen and what everybody else has been through up to that point in the show. You know irrefutably at this point, there is something wonderful about this place, something dangerous about this place, but something declaratively special. Um, And to get that message going from somebody who can come across as fairly irrational in John lock to somebody who would like to fancy himself a very rational person in jack but a very stubborn person in jack there's so much tension that's baked in right there that that not only serves as um just like such a fantastic scene that that puts such a great point on everything that we've been you know fighting through in the first season but it is really why it underlines the rest of everything else and and why you can have a moment like that in the season finale and still have five full ridiculous seasons to come from that like everything really (laughs) That is kind of like the Godhead moment in a lot of ways, that that conversation in the jungle. It's great. And that's not even the best scene of the episode as yeah. far as I'm concerned. Well, it's just I, like, I do like, you know, it's there's so much. It's nonstop. I like how you mentioned Operation because Locke goes, did you ever play Operation as a kid, you know, right. to the surgeon? But, uh, you know, he's and he goes, and he goes like that. And I'll say, goes, <laughs> which oh, freaks boy. Jack out. What, what said, an asshole. That, that, <laughs> John Locke can be such an asshole. And that's a big asshole move. As John said, like, too soon, man. You just saw the guy blow himself up. Jack still has arse on him. He still him. has arse on him. Yeah. And he's like, he's like, oh, let's, let's, uh, and I love that Jack responds, like, do you like to play games, John? <laughs> like, you're, absolutely. I, but, but the thing is, uh, to that point, again, even amidst all this, uh, this, action with you know the hatch being blown up jack takes this moment to sit down with kate and say we're gonna have a lock problem and right. this obviously you know i think one of the big uh cliffhangers is obviously not uh the 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 very controversial shot down the hatch quite literally of jack and lock looking down it uh but i think that it also did an interesting job of setting up some character dynamics and certainly that 
one line, I think, really, you know, is going to put a pin and at least directly moving forward the debate about the hatch as to whether or not you let that timer run down, which is essentially the big argument that's going to embroil them and eventually right. shut them up. Well, you, uh, Josh, you, you painted uh, both Locke and, and Jack, I think, perfectly. Jack is stubborn. Locke, Locke is smart and he, and he he knows what he's talking about, but his way of handling it is always wrong. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. It, it's I mean, like he it's like he just has this he and, and you can just, his flashbacks are I think his flashbacks are the most important because it really shows us he, he he's not the leader. He's he's a soldier. He's someone I would go into battle with, but it's not someone I wouldn't follow him into battle. Right. Because I think, you know, most of them are important, not visits to Thailand or anything. Well, Jack the, goes no, no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they all are important, but Locks to me was because it was always the long debate. As I remember when the show was on, people was like, well, Locks the leader. Lock, I go, are you not watching the flashbacks? Lock, Lock is, he's he's a guy that you could survive on the island. Right. But it's also his undoing is because he's so gullible. He just wants to be accepted and he doesn't care the consequences. He just want you know, his dad, his dad pushed him off of a build out of a building. His his dad stole his kidney. His mom used him for money. I mean, his his, his whole life he was he was mistreated. It's a sad. It's actually a sad story when you go back and look at it. But Absolutely. You see, he just wants to be accepted. And the sad thing is he got a second chance at life. He could walk again. He was in his element that it was surviving, but he he just couldn't. Because like even the scene where the the uh, smoke monster is dragging him down. Because when he first sees this, he's walking to it. Oh, I've seen this before. It's, well, I mean, yeah. I mean, to it, be fair, you see in part one that he does do that, or at least I don't think Smokey approaches him, but he is like standing there with Hurley, like, no, we'll stand still while the others run, and you know, he's able to. It's able to at least go around him, whether or not he caused that or it was correlation. So he thought. Let's do it this time around. Uh, and then, unfortunately, it doesn't work out so well. But I totally you can agree. The, you can see the fear in his eyes. So yeah. it, we know, like, with Echo, it showed images. And I've always wondered what image did he see that just scared him? Because the first time he, he says, I looked in the eye of the island, and it's beautiful. This one scared him. He was he was afraid. It was the uh, the pot farmer. And the <laughs> yeah. out. Like, well, oh, to, no. to your point, though, Jack, I think what really underlines, you know, uh, what Walkabout really shows in a tour de force performance, which is just how sad and melancholy and pathetic this man's life is, is he gets to the gate of Oceanic Airlines and they're like, OK, we don't have a wheelchair, so we're going to carry you in. And you could just see like the simultaneous humiliation and frustration yes. on Terry O'Quinn's face as he has to be carried astride by two Oceanic employees to his chair. And even then, of course, John Locke is the guy who reads the airline safety pamphlets before taking off just so he could be the one to help people, you know, if a, right. an emergency arises. But he can't even reach out and do that. It it's really just shows how limited he felt in his right. life off the island. And that's why he is so audacious on the island. It's not just this guiding of destiny and his gut and faith it's that to he's like point, somebody who got voted out of survivor and thought that it was all over only to find out there's a sign at the end of the pathway <laughs> and you could go to the edge of extinction and hang out there and maybe come back into the game and he's re-entered the game and he's like all right well look at me now i've got this second lease on life that i never thought that i'd have so i just got to play balls to the wall here's an idol there's an idol exactly. rick devins and, and look john at locke is the rick devins of lost i was gonna say or, or you could be chris underlock but i guess right. i don't know who, who that would be in this case uh maybe maybe smoke monster john locke is uh the man in black is the rick devins considering uh the, it's just an unfortunate tragedy there by but the I, end. but i i think that that idea of of uh locke is somebody who who believes that he's here for a purpose because a miracle has happened for him um and indisputably like in in the context of his life a miracle occurred whether or not um you know it was a, a grand manipulation from the man in black or the island naturally healed him i think that the the show still leaves that open enough in the end that you can really kind of interpret that however you want to interpret that um but he has sort of this blind devotion to this idea that he's here for a purpose he's here for a reason mm -hmm. he should just cut his way forward and go on the path that seems to be laid out for him even when it doesn't seem all that pleasant even when it doesn't make that much sense for him in fact when he starts to deviate from that a little bit in season two that's when calamity strikes mm -hmm. and that's when the hatch implodes and that when he that's when he almost brings about the end of the world potentially <laughs> and so he's 
like, okay, I'm not going to do that anymore. Even if I, I was wrong, even if I got to push buttons all the time, I'm going to push buttons all the time. I'm just going to do the stuff that clearly needs to get done. Um, and that inability to kind of like decide for himself in that way, moving forward kind of gets him killed. And I think what, what's, what's great about his arc is that it's most satisfying um, you know, after his death, I think like his his death in service of that and then how other people carry the torch of John Locke forward and right. sort of take the lessons of what John Locke represented of like, yeah, this place is special. Uh, yeah, we are here for a reason. We got to think hard and think smartly about what it is we're supposed to do with all of this and what we're supposed to do here. And that's why Jack in the end is is so effective in, in his final days on on the show and his final days of his life. Um, but none of that's possible without John Locke. So it's so, it's so fun to think about um, that man of science, man of faith conversation yeah. in the context of like knowing how that relationship resolves. And Mike, you brought up the... Um, the the airplane stuff uh and and lock getting brought onto oceanic that's another thing that's so great about exodus that sometimes when i when i do like my accounting of this episode it's not like front of mind for me the raft launch which i still think is just the mm. best scene in the history yeah. of lost Beautiful. uh is is really what comes to mind but the flashbacks of this episode are top to bottom just really really excellent because you get to see these people one last time who they were before their lives changed forever. It is right. their, it is uh, other than like getting up and going to pee and poo in the bathroom on this 15 hour flight uh, well, from know, Sydney to Los Angeles. That, so. Yeah. Locke's got to chill. Um, <laughs> you know, like other than like the mundane stuff that we really don't need to see, like you're seeing their final moments as like pre Island human beings. Um, and who were they then versus who are they just, what is it like a little more than a month later yeah. uh, at the point that Exodus is playing out really really great stuff sometimes it's it's very moving um like wh wh whether it's like the first flashback of exodus being michael and walt and walt screaming at michael you're not my father you're not my father and then it cuts to that uh. really 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 sweet image of the two of them just sleeping side by side they've been working on the raft together their right. relationship is healing walt didn't um, burn this one. he didn't burn this one uh or if it's something as hilarious as like the easter egg packed hurley scene oh my god which is right. which like they devoted so that is like I forgot. That's like a five minute. It's segment. great. I, I mean, mean numbers on class. numbers on numbers. So, you know, a lot of the time, I think lost. He needs, he needs, well, he sees Charlie. Right. Exactly. Yeah. He, see, he sees Charlie there. I think Lost often lives and dies by its format. Uh, you know, one of the great things that it chose to do was to incorporate the flashback structure, which can give us the flash forwards eventually. Sideways, you can take or leave, whatever. Uh, but like, I, I think oftentimes an episode lives or dies by the quality of the flashback. I think that's a huge piece of why people, you know, loathe uh, the Jack's Tattoos episode, for instance, because that flashback is just ridiculous um, or, or whatever the case may be, which is an episode Mike and I just talked about on our podcast. Um, but the, the flashback component here is so strong because it has such purpose for where they are. Like the past is informing the action now so directly and so beautifully. And I just, I love that piece of this episode. And then on top of that, we're still finding out new things. You know, uh, right. I, I loved, obviously, knowing me, I love the Quan stuff. I loved it especially because we see the, the their main flashback scene twice. And it's so interesting from the Americanized perspective where they don't do any subtitles. And we're perceiving it from those two boorish people in the food court making commentary oh, about what they one might Sean, One Sean Hannity. Yeah, he, he kind of looks like it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Wow. Where are like they that. now? Uh, yeah. but, the other, but, but the other one is, you know, we see uh, obviously the translated part of things. And the more interesting part is, you know, we see Jin go into the bathroom where essentially the last thing that's going to happen to him before getting on Oceanic Flight 815 is a guy from representing Mr. Pate comes in and is like, hey, uh, you think you're free. You're not. We're always going to have eyes on you. I always loved yeah. that scene because uh, obviously I don't speak Korean on our podcast. Mike does, but it's only mm -hmm. when he's prepared. Uh, but there's that there's that great scene where the guy who works for, for Mr. Pake suddenly starts speaking Korean and what he says, and he says it so threateningly is, ah, now that's a paper yeah. towel i like, oh, always yeah. loved that line <laughs> what a threatening thing to say to somebody ah now that's a paper towel but on, but <laughs> i guess the the big piece of new information is we get introduced to a new character in the finale i mean aside from obviously mr friendly who's gonna become a big part but this is the introduction of anna lucia which right. i remember at the time everyone when they found out that anna lucia was going to make an appearance in season two 
I, I was pretty pumped. I think the community was because this was a brand new character that was introduced. We don't exactly know who she is. It seemed like she at least had some sort of camaraderie or chemistry with Jack, but that was a crazy thing on top of all the crazy things in Exodus is to just throw a brand new person into the mix. And she was in seat 42. Right. Jack was in seat 23. And at that point, we know the numbers are a thing. Yes. And so you're like, oh, she's going to be really, really important. Unless there's like some sort of weird, like maybe questionable DUI thing. Yeah, exactly. That goes on. <laughs> Otherwise, well, she's going to be of critical importance. Too, one too many uh, tequila and tonics. It right. Seems. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's she likes to drink. What are you going to do? <laughs> the stress, it's a stressful life Anna Lucia has led. Well, you're, you're talking about the scene with, with uh, Hurley, and it's a great scene. I love this scene, but the whole time I think, okay, you got to get back to L.A. You have to because your mom's birthday. You can't miss your mom's birthday because she's going to make you just feel like uh, she's going to make you feel guilty for the rest of your life. You're worth $160 million. Why wouldn't you just rent a private jet? I know. <laughs> that may have been the, the right thing. Well, to Hurley's do. still, a, 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 to quote John Locke, a meat and potatoes guy, though. Yeah, I get, I get it, but it's your mom, and you know, I, you don't want to make your mom mad. I don't know. Do private jets do like 10 hour flights from Sydney to Los Angeles? I'm I think sure, that this sure is can, this is right? this is why you have fu money, right? Like this is why you have, <laughs> or should I say, cluck you money? This cluck is, you money. <laughs> this is this is why you've got it, so that you can take that private jet from Sydney to Los Angeles. But thank God he didn't, right? Otherwise, uh, the yeah. show is very different. The fate of the island is is very less different. comical. Yeah, absolutely. But it's it's very funny to to watch that scene in the light of knowing that like Hurley will be the guy in charge at the end of the day. Exactly. Uh, and like how hard he is fighting for that seat on the plane. Uh, last one on, right. The last person on Oceanic 815. Uh, and he's going to be last man on, on the Island too. So going by what we know at the, from the, the, the uh, finale, from the final episode, that Jacob was controlling things, orchestrating who was going to, you know, survive and be there. Was he trying to keep Hurley off the island? Ooh, interesting. Because look at everything. You know, he blows a fuse. Uh, he, he's he, his, he gets a flat tire. He everything that happened to him along the way. To and, but he still gets on the plane. Right. Yeah, but I mean, you could also then like then you have to expand that argument. Is like, did Jacob send the meteor to destroy Mister Cluck's and Trisha? Obviously, Tanaka? he did. Absolutely. Yeah, of course. Jacob just, like, is uh, shot that uh, out of the volcano in the island that we never get to. See. Jacob's essentially Galactus. Yeah. He's devourer of worlds. Yeah. Uh, but basically, I, I, mean, I don't know. I personally think it ties into the the pre Trisha Tanaka is dead. Make your own luck. Uh, you know, this is Hurley as the Jinx, and I wonder if again on this note of fate that son and Claire and Shannon talk about. I think this is more so a thing of like, it's just everything happening to work against Hurley at that portion of time. And maybe it's just due to the providence of Jacob himself uh, that he's able to get on. Maybe he was the one who touched the oceanic, uh, you know, airline attendants keyboard that day. Uh, and so as a result, you know, he, was he touched to the guy the in the scooter. He's like, all right, well, you're going <laughs> to, you're going to need to give this. Yeah, he, he gave him the crazy eights hat uh, right. at, the, at, the, at the souvenir <laughs> shop. So I don't know. I, I feel like actually Jacob was the one that was helping him get onto the flight, uh, you know, working against maybe uh, the, the circumstances that may have been pushing against Hurley at that point to make sure, because to your point, I mean, it's so interesting watching it because in the moment I'm like, oh, man, like if, if only he had not pushed so hard, he wouldn't have been on that island. But now we say, right. thank God he was yes. on that island for a number of reasons. Yeah, I think if you're, um, it, you know, we, when we finally do meet Jacob in season five and we do a Jacob flashback and we see all these different moments where he's touching all the people who we know are going to be candidates, we know who are going to be really important to uh, the, the show's end game. Um, for many of them, not for all of them, though, but for, for many of them, he's meeting them and, um, you know, placing, placing his hand on their shoulders in moments before they got to the island. Um, mm. But that's not the case for Saeed. Uh, he he meets Saeed when oh, right. uh, yeah. when Nadia is killed. Yeah, the funeral, right? And, right yeah, or she, right in the moment, I think, like he asks Saeed for directions, and then Nadia gets uh, slammed into by uh, whoever the Whitmore oh, right. disciple is. Um, yeah. And for Hurley, uh, he may have met him earlier. We don't know, but as far as we know, he meets Hurley after Hurley's arrest. After Hurley is back from the island already, so it's possible to me. And I kind of think that it's a it's a fun read that Hurley wasn't even somebody that was really on Jacob's radar until his time on the island, 
And like he sees him on the island and he's oh, this guy's got like golf tournaments up his sleeve. <laughs> he's throwing <laughs> he's throwing like uh, pantry parties on the beach. Like this is a cool guy. This is a fun guy. Like this is like his Willy Wonka recognizing Charlie Bucket moment. Like he he's the last one to get the golden ticket. And he's like, oh, no, that guy is the one. He's the one who should be using the wonky. Fun time Hurley, the right? Room. Exactly. Good old happy time Hurley. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I don't know. I, I don't know if he was brought to the island the same way as everybody else or if it's something that jacob recognizes in him later on i think either way it's a it's a fun it's a fun way of looking at the character well that's yeah. the fun thing about loss is you could just you can take it any direction you want really yeah i mean there's so many scenes where like we just discussed i i could see it this way you could see it that way and there, is there a wrong answer you, you, it, it, they didn't answer all the questions so that was the beauty that that's what made the show I, I know a lot of people didn't like it because of that but to me that's always been what I did like, okay, I can still have my own imagination, what I think happened and stuff like that. So I just like scenes like that. But we, I want to talk about this scene between Sawyer and Jack, which I think is probably the best scene between them in the entire series. And it's the one where Sawyer tells Jack that he met his dad. Yeah, right. it's such an interesting, I mean, Sawyer in, in Exodus is so interesting because I mean, we've been tracking Sawyer through the first half of season one where he is a grade A a hole. Even oh, yeah. in Confidence Man, where we find out his backstory, he's still acting like an a-hole, pretending like, yeah, I, I hoarded the, you know, the, the inhalers, torture me. Oh, wait, I didn't. Here, Kate, kiss me. Mwah, 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 mwah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we're seeing, you know, we see a helpful Sawyer, especially in part one. Uh, we see, you know, a heavily emotionally invested Sawyer. There's, I mean, the raft scene is just, a beautiful piece of filmmaking that makes me at least well up every single time I see it. And there's moments, you know, where he is checking down the beach, you know, realizing that Kate's not there and you realize that he really does have that connection with her that uh, moves past, you know, him trying to snarkily flirt with her. Uh, and, you know, we see a little bit of him off the island where, you know, uh, he, gets, he uh, gets in trouble for headbutting the prime minister of forestry and agriculture and fishing and all that stuff. Uh, and then you have these moments uh, on the raft where he's like making genuine bonds with people and he's jumping up and down, waving his arms up and down. It, it's incredible to start to watch the transition of Sawyer. And we see it here where, you know, he has this conversation with Jack and they sort of like snarkily give their goodbyes to one another. You know, these were sort of the enemies, the ones at loggerheads before Jack and Locke were. And then Jack turns to go and you see Josh Holloway has a really interesting look on his face. Uh, and we talk, and this happens, you know, as well in the moth of Sawyer doing the opposite. He like withholds information right. at a certain point in time to like almost attack Kate with it. And here he decides to relent and he does it in such a, a simple yet complex way where like he's not directly telling jack this you know he is telling a story he's put two and two together because i believe i forget how many episodes ago but jack mentioned offhand the red Sox quote right uh, but the way Sawyer was able to do this and the way matthew fox responds it's just such a small character moment but it's such a great moment for the two of them as well you know if they had stopped the scene at like well i guess this is goodbye by uh you know it would be adequate for their characterization but not right. very fulfilling not and memorable this, i mean it wouldn't yeah. be something you would remember exactly but this is a moment for sawyer to sort of you know show his own capability of emotion uh to acknowledge you know the way that jack was feeling the way he saw christian shepherd you know speak of his son and the way to give jack closure right you know a month after his dad's death when we saw jack could, could barely come to terms with it and the the fact that they left their relationship on such a dour note he was able to provide him with closure in that moment and uh you could see you could feel jack is incredibly grateful maybe it's not the source he wanted it to come from but he's incredibly grateful to have this closure well like you said josh holloway does a great job because you know jack is walking away they've said their goodbyes and you can almost see is, is, is should i be human should I, do, should I do it? Should I should I be human? Should I let my guard down? Because he's always got his guard up. He, he's going to hurt somebody before they hurt him. I mean, you, and you can see why his back, you know, it, again, another important backstory because, you know, it was a tr tragedy what happened to him as a child. But then he then he goes, then he starts telling the story. And you're like, oh, good. He's finally going to tell him because, you know, you want him at this point, you want him to tell Jack 
what he knows. And I, I just thought it was, it's just a, it's a fantastic. And you know, of course, Matthew Fox is a great crier. So yeah, he, he, gets, he, he gets you choked up every time. Yeah, when he gets Lilly, but certainly. Yeah, up there. No, he, <laughs> he's great. I think, I think Josh Holloway is a really underrated actor. Like I think that, I, I believe so. Yeah. There, there are a few people who are underrating Sawyer as a character in terms of like, when you think about lost, like Sawyer is a standout character. Like yeah. Sawyer is very top of mind. He's always very quippy. Uh, he's, he's often very central to the storyline and the action. Um, he's just a very notable character. He oozes cool when he's not oozing being a douche. Uh, sometimes he's able to do both of those things. That douche ooze. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah that's, that can be nasty. Uh, but as, as, a, as an actor, as far as his range, I think it's a, it's a really underreported story. What I'm saying here is justice for Colony. That was a criminally under <laughs> underviewed show, and I will continue to bang the drum for Colony wherever I can. Uh, and I, and I, but it's so interesting though, because I mean, to your point, Jack, about his backstory, you do have this weird moment though with Michael in the raft, you know, as they're surveying the radar when he's like, wow, you have a lot of patience with that kid. You know, I, I would have shown him the back of my hand a while ago if I was him. And, you know, especially in, in 2019, you're like, oh my God, Sawyer. But then he provides an information which is also a little revelatory. You know, Sawyer right. had, up until Kate did not tell anybody his story whatsoever. He wanted to be that man of mystery. He wanted to, push everything away with a 10 foot pole, but he was able to chop down the 10 foot pole, saw it off and make it into a mast. And he actually ends up telling Michael at least a little bit about his dad. I feel like that's a great step to when we flash to the 1970s and you have Juliet calling him James. You right. know, that that feels like the first step in a long, long journey for Sawyer. That I also don't buy that he would have shown Walt the back of his hand. I don't I, think so. I think, you know, Sawyer, uh, Michael says to Sawyer in this episode, like, either you're a hero or you want to die. And then Sawyer says, well, I'm no hero. Uh, but you are. Like, you yeah. know, it's maybe a little bit further down than you want to show people uh, and even show yourself. But fundamentally... Uh, I mean, you even see it as early on as when Jin tackles Michael for the watch all the way back in House of the right. Rising Sun. Mm -hmm. Sawyer and Saeed are the two guys who go sprinting into action. And it's Sawyer uh, who who helps Michael out. And it's Saeed yeah. who tackles Jin. Uh, like Sawyer, who's been this grade A douche nozzle to everybody around him, actually goes and, and protects somebody. Uh, and that's like his first instinct when he sees the fit hitting the Shan in this moment. Uh, like he decides like, I got to go and I've got to, I've got to, I've got to help out here. Um, so I think that it's one of, it's one of the very first things you ever hear from the character and it stays true all the way through to the end of the series, but certainly all the way through to Exodus. I'm a complex guy, sweetheart. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, it, it's a lot of what happens on on the raft that he's trying to um, he's trying to be the, the, the quick draw in the boat situation when Mr. Friendly shows up. He Not, knows so quick. <laughs> Not quick enough, at least. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy that we are. Uh, I, I feel bad for your guests next week, Jack, that they have to talk about the scene where Sawyer pulls the bullet out of his shoulder. <laughs> <and pulls> his <laughs> That's true. But you mentioned a couple of things about Sawyer. I know we're going back in episodes, but the, the, the torture scene, it's like its like he wanted to bring everyone down to his level. He'd, he'd rather be tortured if everybody was as as bad as he was. He right. wanted to bring Jack down. He wanted to bring all these people down. And it just it's just the way his character is. But like you said, the scene where he's where uh, Michael and, and uh, Jen are fighting over the watch, I, 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 if my first thought was that's out of character for, for Sawyer. But again, it's not. Like you said, he he does have there is a human in there. It just yeah. he takes a while to You know, he he became like the Dread Pirate Roberts, right? Like mm. he's like he's like Wesley becoming the Dread Pirate Roberts, where like he he assumed the mask because it brought him closer to an agenda. Uh he he assumes the name Sawyer to get closer to tracking down uh Anthony Cooper. Um, and somewhere along the way, he becomes like an actual pirate and he, he starts doing actual bad things. But at the end of the day, he's still the farm boy. Like he's still the yeah. guy, you know, he, he's still as you wish princess, you know, like that's still who he is fundamentally somewhere within him. It's a lot harder to get to that guy. And he's never quite as gentle or sweet as Carrie always is, uh, though I'd like to see him take on a rat of extraordinary size. Um, but I, I think that like, he's still, he's still fundamentally that person. I think the rest of the show bears it out. It just takes a really long time 
for him to to reveal himself like he he has himself shrouded in so many different blankets of ugliness um even though he's a very attractive human being uh you know he's got he's got a lot of that darkness that he just hides behind um because i think at his core he actually is not just one of the most heroic characters on Lost. Ultimately, we were talking about, you know, leader leadership and like questionable leadership from John Locke. I think that Sawyer is actually one of the best leaders. Uh, yes, I would agree. And, and, you know, like the Dharma days really bear that out. Uh, like he's able to keep everyone's cover preserved for three freaking years in the 1970s. That's crazy. insane. That's I know crazy. we don't get to see all of that. Uh, but the fact that he's able to hold that shit together <laughs> during the Lafleur days is crazy. Uh, that's a testament of extreme, uh, not just character growth, but uh, character competency, uh, sorry, it's the best is all I'm trying to say. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's hard to argue. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so it's so interesting to like also look at the people who make up the raft because we, we spend such a short amount of time on there. You know, we spend what, I guess, all of part two and most of part three on the raft. But like to see the complicated relationship between Michael and Jin as well, especially I know one of our probably least favorite things from season one, the budding romance between Michael and son, you know, you have this part of this stunning scene in the raft scene. You do have, you know, uh, Michael and son sort of give each other the very awkward handshake before they go. But you have this scene with, you know, Jin and Michael talking where, you know, he looks over the, the book of English words and, you know, they're definitely coming together. They're learning the same language. It's crazy to think, especially watching season one, how like, Daniel Day Kim is going to go from not knowing English whatsoever to like being pretty darn fluent by those aforementioned Dharma days. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, so, but to have them sort of like communicate on a common level and that level being sun is so interesting. And I mean, the watch is so interesting as well, given that again, Jin gets threatened like, you bring this watch to this person or you are going to pay. And I think we right. spoke about this in our House of the Rising Sun podcast. So that might have informed the way he approached Michael initially. Uh, but, you know, Michael offers him the watch, which is a kind gesture, but Jin is giving it back, and he's essentially saying, like, I'm going to leave behind who I was, and maybe I'll be punished for it, maybe I've already been punished for it, but I'm ready to, you know, leave that Jin behind and make good. That's why I left. I'm le I'm leaving to start a new future for my wife off this island. He uh, wants to go back to the original Jin. Yeah, exactly. Before and I, and you start working. So I think it's so interesting. I mean, and I love, Sorry, even outlines it here, like the Han and Chewie dynamic between Michael and Jin, where, again, it's crazy to watch these guys, like, beat the snot out of each other, you know, 19 episodes ago. And now they're like, uh, Jin's like the the skipper to, or the Gilligan to the Michael Skipper, you know? He's like, yeah. he's his first mate. He's, even though they're not able to communicate much, they're, like, really working in sync. Uh, so it's a really fun dynamic. And I guess it's this, this idea of, like, a bottle episode or, like, the cabin fever effect of it all that, like, it's allowing those moments like the Sawyer moments we talked about and these moments here to come out because there's not a lot of room for these four guys to go. And so we, we still get characterization moments from them, even this late in the season. Well, you had a great scene between Sawyer and Walt. Sawyer's reading the, you know, he's reading the, the, the messages. And, 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 of course, Walt's like, you shouldn't be doing that. And, uh -huh. <laughs> and you know, Sawyer's going to do whatever he wants. But right. he, I think he says something to the fact, he goes, did you write when he goes, no, I goes the next, I've, I've written one th one thing and that's to the person I'm going to kill or something. Yeah. Like he and says, it's like, why are you going to kill him? I just have to, I got to <laughs> do it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they've had, just, they've had very mature conversations. Uh, we'd look at, uh, you know... Walt uh, brought him the news back yeah, in, say, uh, all yeah, the best we, daddies. Yeah, yeah, Walt was the one who approached Sawyer and was like, oh, by the way, uh, Claire and Charlie have been kidnapped by Ethan. So, like, I, I think Sawyer accurately reads that Walt has been very matured by the island. He'll be very physically matured once he gets off the island. He's been very <laughs> yeah. emotionally yeah. matured by everything. And he's like, I think the kid can handle this. Considering what Sawyer himself went through at eight, right. I think he understands that, you know... Uh, childhood can uh, harden you in certain ways. Well, I think that Sawyer is somebody who never really fully, like, properly grew up because he's stuck in this childhood trauma. His, you know, mm, parents right. were killed in this horrible, traumatic way. Uh, and he's still stuck on this childhood ambition of killing the people or killing the person responsible for the death of his parents, who, you know, killing the person who robbed him of his innocence, who robbed him of having a normal life. So I think in a, you, you see it in a lot of Sawyer's different um, levels of behavior, like, uh, the name calling, uh, the fact that he's always picking a fight. He's bad at sharing. You know, he's, <laughs> he's, a, he's a little boy. Um, but I but I think that's another reason why, like, if he if he's saying about uh, Walt, like, 
uh, I would have shown him the back of my hand years ago. I, I don't take it that seriously, but if you're to take it seriously, you take it seriously insofar as I think like he's a bit of like a regressed individual. Um, but also that like, this is like what his view of parenting yeah. is because he's got like a very damaged view of that kind of thing. But when maybe, maybe, maybe he was thinking of Boone. Right. It's true. It's true. You know, but like when push comes to shove or like when boat comes to boat and Mr. Friendly and the others show up and it dawns on Sawyer that not only are these people, uh, you know, not friendly, uh, despite the name, uh, not only are these people not here to save them, but they're actively here specifically for the kid. His right. first thing is like, I'm going to defend the kid. I'm going right. to, I'm going to, I'm going to shoot these people. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, th I think like that is, that is really baked into the character. Uh, and that scene with him and Walt on the raft, it's, it's kind of a throwaway again, like in an episode that is so packed with so much great stuff that it's easy to kind of gloss over that one. But I think it's a really, really good scene. Yeah. And I mean, again, like knowing that albeit Locke's storyline kind of spirals a bit down, especially in season two, when Malcolm David Kelly is all but absent, save, you know, two minutes in two minutes uh but I, I think that you know it it's it's still such a powerful scene you know you have this hopefulness the giacchino score really backs it up Amazing. where you know they fire off the flare and the boat turns around it's just a ping on a radar uh and there's silence in this you know underlying the scene beforehand but once it happens like they're jumping up and down they're screaming the spotlight turns on we're there with them and then you just have mr friendly go like thing is we're going to have to take the boy hey. and everything just drops. And I love, what? I mean, <laughs> yeah. it's set up so well right beforehand when Russo goes on this crazy baby napping expedition. Cause she says the whispers were saying that, you know, uh, they were taking the boy. Obviously in that case, that was the whispers of the others, not the whispers of the dead people. Maybe uh, that would be very interesting and certainly a topic for uh, another conversation. But I mean, just the, the horror behind this between the action of Sawyer getting shot, you know, Michael trying to defend his son, Malcolm David Kelly just screaming his face off. And yeah, know, well, I that's not a nothing deal, too. I mean, this is a, you know, this this is a young actor who's a series regular on one of the biggest shows of the of the moment when this show is airing. Um, a character who you're really invested in because apparently he's got super animal talking powers. You want to know more about that and like what's up with <laughs> yeah. his telepathy and everything like that. But you've also like really come to um you've come to like kind of accept Walt's presence within the ensemble. And, you know, we're, we're at a place in, in the narrative by the end of the season where you're willing to entertain the possibility that really bad things could happen to some of these characters because Boone is dead. So they've killed right. a main character at this point. Um, but the kid's going to be fine. Like they're not going to do anything to the kid. And then they take the boy and Malcolm David Kelly is screaming his head off for his yeah. dad. And much Whoa. like, you know, much like Sawyer, I do oh. think like, yeah, there's still like a childishness to to what, but sometimes there's like a serious seriousness to him. There's a high degree of competency when he can like throw the knife in special the way that he can do, or right. he's just so lucky with games. Like there's almost there there's kind of like a, a wise beyond his years quality to Walt, but like that becomes another regressive moment where like you yeah. see just this boy in distress who is screaming like crazy for his dad, for this guy who at the very beginning of the episode, uh, not coincidentally, right, yeah. uh, the very first scene of Exodus is him saying, you're not my father, you're not my father, in the hotel in Sydney, and the very last appearance of Walt in the season, and almost for all intents and purposes, the series is him screaming, dad, dad, help me. And poor freaking Michael just stuck in the water screaming oh. Walt and stuck on a Walt screaming loop for the next several episodes. I was going to say, oh. I, I know it's become very, it's become very mimetic of him screaming. Walt, but it's, but like, it's, it's so traumatic. And, and, it's, it's and that's terrifying. the thing is I just remember feeling like so brutalized by that moment. Yeah. And I think when you, when, when you talk about uh, the season one finale, historically, a lot of that conversation does center on like the, the agonizing amount of time that you spent wondering what's down the hatch, what's down the hatch. Hell, Mike, we named a podcast after <laughs> it. Like we didn't call it. They took the boy, although that was an alternate. That would name. be a, that, I think people will be tuning into that for very different, different podcasts, reasons. very different subjects. Very matter. different podcasts. We are not recommending or endorsing the they took the boy podcast. Uh, but 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 you know, I I think because of like the mystery factor behind like they've been building up the hats for so long, and then they left you like with this note of like, holy crap, I can't believe they're not just giving us the answer to that. 
that. And that was the question that you were wondering, like that just kind of became like the, the real um, water cooler piece that you took away right. from the finale. Um, but the, but it was almost like there was like this, this trauma that people like weren't really ready to digest or talk about. If like they freaking took the kid. They took yeah. Walt. Walt got I mean, kidnapped. It, it was horrible to watch. It blew, it blew, it it blew up the raft. So we, yeah. and Sawyer gets shot and it falls. So we have no idea what's going on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you I, really, a really you, tough cliffhanger. You mentioned Ma Malcolm David Kelly's acting. Because so many shows, I think, are ruined by kids that yeah. can't act. And sometimes the kids, it could be their acting. It could be the lines. I mean, it, there's, there's certain shows that I've actually stopped watching because I, I can't take that anymore. It's like nails on the chalkboard. He held his own. With some of the best actors at the uh, at, uh, that are on TV at 100%. that time, yeah. Well, it's and so interesting. You know, I think we speak a lot about how Boone dying is obviously a big moment in season one, but in my opinion, the kidnapping of Walt is the end of innocence of loss. Because I feel like, to your point, Josh, I think that though Walt is matured beyond his years, I he's feel a like kid. He, he's still yeah, he still represents this like innocence, this naivete almost to the world. He's still asking questions, even to Sawyer. You know, minutes before he's taken, and I think the fact that he is taken in that moment it hammers home it also really hammers home i know that we had ethan before but this really shows like okay Rousseau's not just talking malarkey there are others right and they are deadly and, and it and it frightening it, it personifies that threat again in a really yeah. which, and i think that that was a really important thing for the show to do because um you, you know ethan was such a scary character uh, and like, just like sort of like the slack jawed death stares that he would always <laughs> give, like with this, like his ghoulish form, like, you know, like kind of like golemly crawling out of like mud, uh, mud hills and towards you is like, that's like the stuff of nightmare fuel. That's like, you're tripping on something. And like, that's the creature that, that crawls into your brain. And you're like, I'll never shake that free from my mind ever Mate's again. Back on the menu. But then he, but then he's dead, you know, like he's dead after, uh, you know, he, he's dead after home coming he's gonna he's gonna pop up every now and then but he's only gonna be the stuff of the past he's never gonna be right. an, an ever-present threat anymore and so at that point um the show really needs to re-establish some human evil and man they pull that off pretty well with 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 showing us uh you know a character who at the who at the time, I think that it was known that it was MC Ganey who was playing yeah. the playing the part, and that was an actor that I really liked already. So I was so stoked to see him on Lost. But he comes out like this, uh, uh, like this, like this old like ghost pirate, right? He's like like, like uh, Gordon, the Gordon's Fisherman box, essentially. you know, like, but he's yeah. the yellow jacket. <laughs> he's like he's like modern day Barbosa. Like this is like you know this is not somebody of our time, and this is not somebody of our mortal plane of existence. Uh, you know, like I think that they come to like really demystify Mister Friendly over the course of the show yeah well when we get when we get to the hunting party they're like okay take off the beard and he just like pulls off well he's you know, still he's still jump. pretty scary there but I, I think it's the season two finale where he takes it off you're like i guess i'm not that afraid of him anymore but they got michael emerson at that point they're like all yeah. right we've we figured out a way to one-up <laughs> it uh right. but it was it was a really smart idea to to take to not only take walled away and end innocence as much as innocence existed on lost at that point to your point mike um but also to do it with a character who um who would become like kind of iconic in his own right i mean just past my my shoulder i guess that that shoulder over there like you can see i've got the i've got the the, the poster of uh that's mr friendly holding walt in the raft in the palm of his hand uh like it's just like it's it's like an iconic piece of the of the lost lexicon yeah. uh and and to introduce that in the finale even if mr friendly isn't like an end game boss you know he's just going to be like the boss of certain stages of lost moving forward if you were to map it in video game terms Terms. um he's still like a really notable one a really memorable one it was a really really smart thing for the show to do yeah i have to agree now i want to go to it probably not as important but something's always bothered me about the marshall and kate yeah i've asked i've asked this like three or four times i always think there was i thought there was something more like they had a relationship because he yeah. takes it so he takes it so personal and even in this one he tells the he tells the uh, custom guy kate you how kate uses you're talking about that scene he was basically telling how Kate uses people. It was like he was he was he was hurt hurt by Kate. You know, she taunted me. She did this to me. She because I just she's not public enemy number one. She she did some bad things, but it's not like she's a serial killer that you would go all the way to Australia to to set her up. No, just, just a one time killer. No serial yeah. killer involving. Um, I, I, I get it, but it's just like okay, as a marshal, it just it was personal to him. 
Oh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, I know on the podcast, I made this comparison, but it really reminds me of uh, the movie Catch Me If You Can, the dynamic between uh, Frank Abagnale Jr. and uh, Hanratty, that this idea of like uh, the perp and the person chasing them, the hunter and the hunted. And I think there is some emotional attachment. You know, Mars does bring up this thing of like how she does like they call each other. Well, we see that in the Nathan Fillion episode where like they call each other. It's a very weird relationship, but yeah. like, he has dedicated so much of his life to this manhunt that I think there is some sort of idolization going on there. Uh, and so uh, it makes sense why he also would be gloating to this poor customs person yeah. and, you know, uh, is, you know, throwing it back in Kate's face because this is his white whale. This is who he has been after audaciously for years. And she has escaped him every single time. Now he finally has her. Uh, and it's, I mean, she's going to slip out of his grasp once again, but it, it's obsession and it's not exactly, you know, fun to watch. But yeah, Edward Mars is such an interesting study because we're going to find out some more things about him, but we only know him through Kate. And I think that's appropriate. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I remain unconvinced as to why he needed all the guns. Like the the, ex <laughs> the example that he gives of like goading her into like uh yeah. you know like into like physically assaulting him and then he's able to just like kind of like head butter off of himself is like and that's why I need four guns. I, if I were the guy, I'd be like, seems like you could just head butter if you need or, to, or even though that's typically her signature. Move. If I was the guy, I'd be like, that's a you problem. Yeah. That's not enough. She's not gonna headbutt anybody else. Uh, yeah. Which I also do love the fact that you know we just again uh, cover whatever the case may be where Sawyer gets headbutt duped twice. Yeah. Which he should know better, considering that's a move he pulls in Australia. Maybe he forgot about it. I don't know some sort of brain tissue loss from all the headbutting he's doing. It can happen. Concussions, you know, do affect you over time. So that could be it. But yeah, it just, I was, I, I do like the scene where he, she's, he's, he's, he taunted Kate. He just said, you know, I, I, she, you know, this is the girl that used a guy to rob a bank to steal a airplane, but for, I can't remember the guy's name and she ended up killing the guy anyway. Right. And right. so it's like, of course, she goes on. Yeah. <laughs> it's Tommy. Yeah. Who she killed? Yeah, I mean, basically, yeah. She yeah, got, she got him killed. She may as well have done the deed. Yeah, uh, I mean, he could have he, he could have got out of the car. Yeah, yeah. It'll definitely be uh, on our on our podcast. We assign MVP points and LVP points uh, for every episode. And uh, my hallmark so far has been: if you die on Lost, you automatically get an LVP point. Uh, to the point that people are very afraid of what I'm going to do when we get to through the looking glass with the not pennies boat of it all. Yeah, jo Rule Josh rules are rules. I don't know. I may jo not have a choice, but Josh I can a very tell you. Cool man, very it's cool man on the on the we like taking boys podcast. Josh is just a very <laughs> mean person. <laughs> Tom Tommy's definitely going to lose some points when he gets a born to run. I can tell you that much. Another question I had is when they're going out, when they're they're finally leaving, and Saeed's leading the hike up to the caves. And then Charlie Russo comes in and says, oh, they, they, you know, this and that. And, and so Charlie runs to go get Saeed. Then, you know, we find out that Russo takes Aaron. Mm -hmm. Why didn't Saeed already have the guns? Yeah. Yeah. yeah cause, cause he Great goes question. to, he goes to the case to go yeah. get the gun. So maybe he was like, I don't know. I'm my assumption is there's 40 people. He's leading them in shifts. Maybe he felt like he'd go back for the guns then as the last thing he also i mean charlie was at this point very squirrely about getting this to the point where i forgot about this when it, when it turns out that Aaron got kidnapped charlie just straight up punches saeed in the face and yes. unlike all the other characters who like definitely follow through and fall saeed just takes it like a champ and he, he does not flinch he doesn't drop an ounce of blood he's just like do not do that again i wonder <laughs> i wonder other like that short, a great scene. short short of benjamin linus I, I wonder if there's anybody competitive with Charlie Pace for being either the puncher or the face punchy uh, with, mm -hmm. with so many other main characters. He punches Sawyer in the face. He punches Saeed in the face. He gets punched in the face by John Locke. I'm sure that there's others that I'm forgetting, but I feel yeah. like it's competitive at least. I mean, I guess, I don't know if you if you count, like, the confrontation in the end. If that's the case, then you might have to include the man in black and Jack in there just considering they're exchanging so right. many blows. But I feel like if you're covering, like, a character per punch basis, I think Charlie has that metric on lock. I think that that's probably true. It's sad that Locke doesn't have it on lock. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, no, no, uh, he he has the uh, the injuries per leg on lock. <laughs> uh, ha, we 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 gotta we gotta talk about about Arst. How oh, we, we, yeah, how, how can we get this far that, without that having to talk about Arst? Yeah, we gotta do it. It's so crazy. <laughs> yeah, I mean that, this this in my opinion, I I t uh, texted Josh this before we got on here. This in my opinion may be the funniest scene in all of Lost, and it is dark. But... And most and most shocking is I I didn't see that coming because he was so being so uh you know snob you know, snobbish or conceited on this is how you have to do it I I'm mean, the one to do it he was art explaining he's like yeah. oh, okay no you like do you know what happens to nitroglycerin in 90 degree heat it sweats uh yeah. and so yeah he's so careful with it he's demeaning everybody else and then Prince, just Prince says, give me your shirt yeah and just one <laughs> this gesticulation one spare hand movement and it just goes kaboom and i just love I mean, it's just incredible. And, you know, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't exactly know how much people thought Arts was going to be long for this world. He'd only been introduced a couple of episodes ago. But I oh remember my at the time there, there being chatter that like this was a new main character. Like this was mm. kind of the, the, in, in like the run up to the finale. Like if you were following like the dark UFOs of the world, uh, there were like uh, there were there were conversations about like, OK, so this this actor, Daniel Roebuck, is joining the cast as this mysterious character named Doc. Dr. Arst. And I think when you just hear that name, Dr. Arst, and you already have the context of the others in your mind, like that sounds pretty sinister. Yeah, if you rearrange the letters again. And I like I had remembered Daniel Roebuck from, from The Fugitive uh, being part of uh, Tommy oh, Lee yeah. Jones's crew of, of U.S. Marshals and indeed appearing in U.S. Marshals. Uh, and like being like, I don't know like how like nervous I am about that actor playing like a big nefarious guy, but I guess I'm, I'm open-minded to it. And then he shows up in Born to run you're like i don't think that he's going to be like that much of a mysterious character but i guess he's here to stay because that's what everybody seems to be talking about and then he just blows the f up in exodus and it's <laughs> it's hysterical it was such a surprise because i think i i don't know how much that was just like a, a testament of like the lost fandom already kind of like rapidly devouring every yeah. single nugget that you could possibly get um, on the internet at that point in time as like, you know, kind of like internet fandom is really starting to boom uh, around the advent of Lost um, or or if it's just like that was like an, an intentional design of like really making you think that this is going to be a very important character. Uh, but what they end up doing with him is just so funny. It's just it's such a great gag. Uh, so much so much so that they can't resist but like do it again at the end of the series with Alana, uh, yeah. which which I really hated at the time, but I I've, I've really come around on that. Like, I think it's kind of, like anytime you can unexpectedly blow somebody up on loss, it's probably going to be a pretty good time. Yeah. Maybe, uh, maybe the ghost of arts was in that second outrigger. Maybe that's who it was. It's possible. <laughs> yeah. We finally got the answer. Yeah, that's it. That's, that's, great. that's it. great. But it is, like you said, it is a great scene and he's a, he's a great character. Yes. Even though we only get him for a short time. It just was, uh, he was so, he, he had that poor, you know, poor me. I'm not the cool kids table. I'm not the whole, yeah, I, the, I, I love that. He's an amazing character. I forgot about that pre-expose. Like, this is a very meta moment, even at the end of a first season for this character to be like, yeah, you guys that are the focus of the show think you're important, but there's plenty of the rest of us. And I wonder how much of that attitude was already swirling around the writer's room that informs things like the other 48 days and the unfortunate introduction of Nikki and Paula when they think like, okay, we need to bring fresher faces in here. Uh, but I do love it that our sort of has not necessarily his last stand, but like his venting moment. Like he has a semi festivus here and that he really is airing the grievances. Yeah. He tries a feat of strength with the dynamite, but ends up failing. Now we see Smokey because he arts leaves. Remember he just takes off. He goes, ah, I, I, I made a mistake. Well, he hears about it. Montan losing his arm and right. Uh, yeah. Once he says, okay, I'm good. Here's a, here's a few quick wiki how tips as to how to handle dynamite. Yeah. Bye. Little does he know he's going to lose a lot more than his arm. Now we have Smokey chasing after him. Was it was that part of the plan because maybe he knew that Art was he was going to blow himself up? Hmm. Good that maybe that because because he's ch he ch he didn't he didn't follow through attacking him. He just basically chased him back to the pack. Well, I I do not correct me if I'm wrong. Or I don't think Art is a candidate, right? So I no, honestly I think the man in black is honestly just having a good time. <laughs> like I think we, what well, we talked in the the pilot about, you know, when uh, you know, when the monster really makes an impression by like hauling up trees and roaring while the people are making camp to really make a good first impression. Because again, the monster wants to present itself as something, you know, very dark and mysterious and weighty. Uh, so I can imagine like 
yeah, devouring arts would uh would definitely be something. I I don't know. I personally don't subscribe to the thing of like, yes, the smoke monster knows what's going to happen, and so it really has to organize things. I think it's just it's manipulation, and I can imagine that like sending the little piggy squealing back to his herd <laughs> is uh you know a, a good way to really scare people. Yeah, I uh, I. I love that idea. I mean, one of the things, and I think it's because I, I really, I saw a lot of what you were talking about, Jack, with, with John Locke as a character early on of a lot of people like being like, uh, you know, like he's the leader, he's the chosen one, he's the promised right. one and feeling like his arc was always more steeped in tragedy. Um, and really wondering, like, I mean, definitely feeling like he was going to be special and, and end game important considering, um, you know, he's he's in the casket at the end of season four. And you're like, OK, so how does he get there? Uh, because that's going to be a big piece of the resolution right. of this story. At that point, you know that the show is going to end. Um, but I, I had always felt like he was not meant to be like the guy in charge of the island or anything like that. So when in season five, it's revealed that like, no, he didn't come back to life. Uh, there's somebody walking around doing a really good John Locke impression. It clicked for me immediately that that was the smoke monster. And I, I remember spending that whole summer, that whole off season between five and six uh, being so hyped for the final season because I was like, Oh lost. Oh, Damon Lindelof, you clever bastard. The question <laughs> isn't what is the smoke monster? It's who is the smoke monster? Who is that guy? And so they, I don't think that they have that on the board as early as season one. I think the idea of the smoke monster being a character must come a little bit later. Um, but because you know that the smoke monster is a character, it does become fun to like retcon some of the smoke monsters actions and, and go back and think of like, so what do we know about the man in black? Well, we know he's really nihilistic. We know that he thinks people are just here to tear each other apart. We know he's been here for like thousands of years and has no hope of leaving. We know that he has no like real corporeal form. Like he is uh, this, you know, cloud of smoke that can shape shift into dead people. He's probably pretty freaking bored. So when people show up on Oceania, 815 in that first night he's just like yay new people to terrorize this is so exciting yeah. <laughs> and like that's what that's what mike and i talked about in our recap of the pilot and i think that you can you could say that there's a degree of that here especially because yeah arse isn't a candidate but here's like a pretty high quality gathering of candidates in front of him i think rousseau is on the list of candidates i believe, yeah, she is, I, yeah. I believe, so, yeah. I believe that she's on the list so she, there's rousseau there's jack there's you know you got rousseau you got shepherd you got reyes you got austin uh this is like a uh, you've got Locke there this is a pretty cool who's who and like Let's see what this group does together. And by the way, this guy, Ars, who's probably going to blow up in a few minutes, is trying to run away. I'm getting him back into the group because that's going to accelerate <laughs> things and be really fun. So like, I, I, anytime you can think of the monster with like that level of agency and sort of like that level of sadism, I think is a really fun way to read the character. Yeah, humanizing the monster is has just been so much fun in hindsight. And you just saying Endgame just made me realize, spoilers for Endgame, that I can't determine if Locke is Natasha Romanoff or Tony Stark. Uh -huh. uh, but he's one of the two. And Jack is definitely Captain America, right? Which makes Hurley uh, the Falcon uh, in terms of like passing off the shield. Oh my god. I mean, I don't know. Uh, I think that there's an argument that Jack is Iron Man in the end. Uh, the guy who's the who's the non-believer who like refuses to, to to buy that line of like this is destiny um, is, is constantly trying to like outthink the problem rather than like feel out the inevitability mm. of a problem. And then in the end is, you know, veritably throwing himself on the grenade to save the day. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that that maps pretty well, but we could spend a long time. Yeah, talking about that sounds like a bonus podcast. <laughs> we, we, well, Josh, we'll put it on the on the map. Yeah, yeah. Well, Josh, you mentioned something about how you, you knew it was it was smoky in in lock. After, after I was so mad at myself because that lock was so much more confident, so much more. <laughs> he he just he didn't make the mistakes. And I'm like, and the whole time I kept thinking. I, something's not right. I remember podcasting about, and when we got the real, I go, "How did I not figure?" I, I was like the biggest lock basher in the world, yeah. and I didn't, I couldn't figure. I go, I was so mad at myself because I even said, "Dead is dead." I said, "What's going on with this lock guy?" And I it, couldn't it was, figure it out either. Yeah, it was like what once once he pours out of the casket and he walks in and he goes into Jacob's, you know, uh, you know, headquarters underneath the statue, right? Uh, and uh, you know, he has that moment of. You have no idea how long it took me to get here. I'm like, oh shit, 
Oh no, Smoke <laughs> Monster's the final boss. This is crazy. And Terry O'Quinn gets to play the final boss. That's uh, so genius. Uh, and I just, I'm, I'm still not thrilled that they just continue to call him Locke in the final season. That still bums me out. And I wish that they'd figured yeah, out a way around. You have that, a nickname but. guy like Sawyer and he couldn't come up with like the flock or, you know, what, whatever everyone else was calling him. I was him. calling him Smock. I, a lot of people were calling Smock. him Smock. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's, I mean, to your point though, those are the best twists, in my opinion, are the ones that you are A, surprised by at the time, but B, when you trace your steps back through even just the most immediate season, you say, oh my God, they were there the entire time. And I think that's one of the most, you know, the biggest, best twists. You could also say, if you look at uh, Through the Looking Glass, you know, all the flash forwards that we see of Jack are done in such a great, vague way where they could be okay we're looking at jack and rock bottom we know he's been here before so this is just another part of jack and yet another oh, season God. three jack flashback and then giant game changer absolute game changer for the series and it's it, it, lost was just able to do that incredibly in so many ways not only with plot but also with character again even like yeah. the, the sawyer reveal we just talked about how it informs so much of his behavior in the first eight episodes so when you know it and you look back on it it all makes logical sense it's just it's such a I mean, we can knock the writing sometimes, uh, you know, across the board of the show, but just I, I, on the whole, it's just such a masterfully crafted piece. Well, it really, it, it really great, is. great storytelling. It's just excellent storytelling. So much about it is so exciting. Uh, it's, it's, I think it's underrated in terms of um, the performances. I think are really spectacular. Yeah. The setting is unbeatable. The music is unbeatable. Um, the that water cooler quality about Lost uh, has not been anywhere even remotely close to being captured since then except for game of thrones i would say is the only thing that's a real contender arguably maybe walking dead uh to a certain point um even though i think those days are are, are waning even though i think the show is better than it's ever been right now um or at least in a long time um but it's just it's such a rich show and i know like bloom and i we you know we're podcasting about it every single week we're about halfway through season one at this point and it's been such a joy to like crawl back over this show and jack i just want to say to you like og of this yeah. community you know somebody who has, who has been such a fixture in the lost community for such a long time um and and is such a foundational part of of the reason why you know something like down the hatch exists and and here you are at the end of your season one rewatch. I mean, you still- I thought you were going to say end of my life. Because I am pretty <laughs> no, old. I, I no. am pretty old. I'm getting up there in age. Yeah, but the then the smoke is going to take on your likeness. So we'll still be able to have you on YouTube. We'll be wonderful. Yeah, can't wait for talk to Flack. He's going to be a lot He's going to be a lot more confident. He's going to know what he's talking about. He's going to be a great character. Uh, but no, for, for you, I mean, I know that you're revisiting Lost for the first time in a while after having yeah, lived been about, with- been, been about four years, yeah. You know, having lived wow. with a, a lucky number, you know, and yeah. having lived with it very- very closely for for such a long time and having it be such an important part of your life for you like getting through the end of exodus and now as you're looking down the barrel of, of season two immediately looking down the hatch at season two but looking at everything else beyond um for you since you're you're you know twice the way that mike and i are <laughs> at, at, as far as where we are in season yeah. one like how has this process been for you like tripping back down the rabbit hole and getting i was i was one? a little worried because I, I you know i was like going okay do i want to do this again i go you know what I've been wanting to do a rewatch. Let's let's do it. And I, I you know, I had the idea of getting different people, like said, you know, you guys, and and just talk, get different, you know, feedback and different views of what happened. It's been great. The hard part has been stopping at just two episodes. Yeah. Yep. Because I like finished Exodus. Exodus. I go. Oh wait, I want to watch because I know that. I, well, I got to stop because if I do that, then I'm gonna get confused with what's going on. You know, I'm, I'm older and just get confused. So I I I I, try, I do stop myself at two episodes. And that is the hardest part because this show, and you go, God, this show has been, it's been 15 years since the show started. And it's still, still, still perfect. It still holds up. And that's the amazing thing because you can go back and I can go back and watch shows I used to love. Go, Ooh, that's, that, I don't remember this being so bad. Right. This show, it's like, I don't remember it being this great. Yes. Yeah. Totally. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. that's the, that's just the, it's just, it's the perfect show. I mean, to your point, and we certainly have had, you know, again, since you're like double our pace, but we certainly have had listeners that are like, yeah, I'm already, you know, I tried doing the one a week approach and now I'm like halfway through season three. And it really is that, you know, there is this something to be said about the cliffhangers that they really instituted. But what Lost really did in terms of innovative storytelling is that it's such an incredibly connective show. And not just from a characteristic perspective where you see characters obviously, you know, interact with each other on and off the island, but the fact that 
the action, especially in season one, where the real, you know, we get some mythos involved, but it's largely about like, here are people living on an island. How are they going to combat each other? How are they going right. to combat the elements? Uh, but it all sort of flows really nicely to one another. That's what Josh and I have been realizing is like, you know, you have certain, uh, you know, you have a uh, Saeed receiving the picture of Nadia, uh, in episode, you know, when everyone's going through the luggage and, and that, that right. really artfully sets up his flashback. Yeah, it pays off few, five episodes yeah. down the line when he's sitting right. in the beginning of solitary ruminating over it. You know, it, it's in really, you know, plotting out how the season is going to work and even how like a series arc is going to work. It, it's one of those things where you want to keep watching because things have already been set up in episode one that, y you know, we're going to be paying off down the line it, it's less of a show where okay it's a procedural you know there there have been some right. standalone episodes but most of the time it, there's going to be stuff that's mentioned in other episodes that are going to be brought up in other ones so you, you want to keep investigating it'd be like you know stopping and reading a novel after a chapter a writer writes a book with the intention of connecting one chapter to another and so we want to keep reading those chapters uh just to you know keep things running in our brain yeah but one of the things that's so brilliant about television and i think that it is something that is um that we're losing to a certain degree in the era of the streaming wars begun these streaming wars have uh <laughs> is is we are finding ourselves in this place where you just want to binge a show like you would read a book and some shows are built that way some shows are right. designed for that level of consumption. Um, and then there are other shows that just fundamentally understand the unit of television is an episode. Uh, and yes, the episode is a chapter of the larger book that is the show, but there's something about constructing the chapter. There's something mm. about constructing the episode. And that is something that has struck me by going back through Lost and watching it at this weekly pace. This is not something that I have done since the show went off the air. I've gone back and rewatched Lost a lot. I did a full series binge earlier this year in the lead up to doing the weekly podcast, and it plays totally differently. That plays like you were sitting down with your favorite novel and cozying up by the fireplace and just completely awashing yourself in a short burst feeling of intense nostalgia that just feels really good when you really need that pick-me-up. This is like every single week, I am I am awed at the structure of the show. I'm mm. odd at like the form of the show. I'm odd at how well they play towards the act breaks. I mean, look no further than than Exodus for so many great examples of that. Oh, yeah. Of Arst blowing up and then like the <laughs> aftermath of everybody just like kind of like being like, and then Hurley literally going, dude, and then smash, <laughs> smash to commercial. You know, like just structurally, the show is is it, it knows what it is. Um, it is so self-assured in that way, or at least it comes across that way. I know when you, when you peek behind the curtain and you, and you do a little digging into some of the creative behind it, self-assured is probably not a word that Damon Lindelof would use to describe lost. He would probably use right. like panicked. We're just trying to, you know, not drown. The raft has exploded and we're trying to keep afloat. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it doesn't it doesn't read that way. It just it just reads brilliantly. Uh, and and it's it's a shame, I think, that there is a, a degree to which you are you are losing some of that um, in in modern television because everything is moving online or because you've heard about this show was really great. And you missed it while it was in the weekly. And so now you're catching up, you know, catching up on on Hulu or Netflix or wherever it is. Uh, and some shows are really built for that. And some shows are really great in that regard. Almost any show uh, will binge really well, um, but I but I think that you'll you'll miss some details. Like you'll miss some of that community. You'll miss oh, especially some of especially with Lost. Exactly. Yeah. 100%. You'll, you'll, you'll miss the jungle for the trees. Yeah. Uh, on that note of structure, I mean, something that I had forgotten about is we mentioned that raft scene, which is in the second to last act. The last six minutes of the episode, everything after that is done in silence, or not in silence, right. but like nothing's <laughs> spoken. It's yeah, montage. all underscoring music. between the return to the caves between the flashback of everyone getting on and you know everyone uh, well they they let one of its the show's strongest characters do the speaking in that yeah. moment that's giacchino yeah. and, yeah. I actually, they, and, and i think it's a great moment as well because again like you said joss it's just an emotionally hefty moment to have the lost you know the raft happen and to have walt get taken that like i feel like it deserves to have the last word yeah you know like it is not the big cliffhanger that's going to end the episode but we're almost you know memorializing it in a certain way that like that's the last you'll hear from these characters. Well, and, it's funny because yeah. one, one of the, I, I don't know if it's the first line of spoken dialogue, but it's pretty damn close is 
Walt. Michael. Yeah. It's Michael <laughs> screaming for Walt. And so for Michael to be screaming for Walt as the last spoken dialogue of the season feels really, really appropriate. Uh, and you're just kind of, you're left to like linger in, uh, in like in, in this case, sort of this, um, like this bittersweet panic. Uh, and like this feeling of like uh, escalating tension, but also like sort of this sadness for, uh, you know, seeing these people boarding the flight and sitting down and helping each other with luggage. Mm. And they're all, you know, off on this journey that they don't realize they're about to go on. Uh, and and likewise, we're, we're not just saying goodbye to them in their normal lives. We're saying goodbye to the show in the in the context of when it was airing for yeah. the next several months. Um, luckily, I mean, this is the benefit of, of the streaming era is like, you just get to, you just get to play next. You just hit the next right. button. And you exactly. Get to going. Um, but that's a very different experience than, than what it was at the time. Um, but they're, they're both great experiences. And I, I just, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm thrilled that you had us on for this episode. Cause it's, it's just, now this, this has been, this has been great. Uh, I mean, I, you know, it just, I could talk to you guys about loss forever. I mean, forever. B- b- before we forget, give your guys, uh, give your information, your podcast, any information you guys want to go. I know you guys are doing a lot. Yeah, so. <laughs> there's a lot going on. Uh, if, if you if you're enjoying uh, any of the lost takes that Mike and I have, we podcast about it every week at Post Show Recaps. Our rewatch is called uh, "Lost Down the Hatch." Working a, title: We'll take your boy. We'll take the boy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I I also uh, like we raft to go back. Uh, no, we no we, we raft to go Jack. Let's raft to go Jack. Uh, no, <laughs> lost Lost Down the Hatch is the name of the podcast, and we're doing one episode a week it is full tilt spoiler discussion so uh obviously if you've made it this far here uh then you've watched all of lost or you don't care about spoilers same deal over at down the hatch we're talking about it from the context of the whole show uh and we're going really long on those podcasts <laughs> basically basically twice as long as this podcast yeah so each podcast is, is is typically I give, you, I give you guys credit for that that's a, that's a it's uh, a lot it's a lot it's a lot it's a, it's a marathon it's a marathon for sure each podcast but but, is, they're, but they're in but they're interesting so it's if you're you're keeping well you're, we, it's, we, it's, it's, it's not boring so no, we're, we're jack and desmond running in up and down the steps of the stadium <laughs> right you know? yeah 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 we're gonna twist our ankle at some point along the way but as long as we lift it up we should be okay exactly uh but each podcast is it's out about two and a half to three hours sometimes uh we're taking feedback from people we're we're doing you know stupid things like ranking mvps and lvps of each episode fairly arbitrary but really really fun and goofy we bring sound clips in from each episode so you get to listen to lots a little bit along the way as well uh, and we do occasional bonus podcasts as well so if any of that sounds interesting to you post your recaps.com slash down the hatch is uh, that'll get you to our our apple feed but you can just look for lost down the hatch on however you listen to podcasts. i'll, I'll post it in the show notes so. cool awesome cool. we awesome. really Thank appreciate you. it uh it's been it's been a blast and i mean yeah. we're gonna we're gonna be talking about lost every single week for <laughs> the next like two two and a half years something like that <laughs> it's crazy uh and it's it's so comforting to have that as just like sort of like I, I'm sure you feel this as well, Jack, right now. Yeah, like this it, is just it, like it, it's so nice to just have this kind of like anchor in your life when life is so freaking crazy right now that like you steadily have, you reliably have lost in your life right now. For like for me, for and I know Mike, like you're you and I are both people, mental health is very front of mind yep. for both of us. Like this has been a huge boon, not Shannon, to my mental health. Uh, <laughs> really to, to have lost in my life again in this way and and the community around lost uh coming back in this oh, way. It's 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 the best. It's awesome. Community. Yeah. It's been no, awesome. Without, without without question. I'm not just saying that. It's the no, best community. Totally agreed. We Josh and I, you know, talked a lot before coming up with this idea of like we're going to have a lot of fun with it. We'll see how people respond and the response behind it has been to be quite honest, probably the most incredible response I've ever had to a project that I've worked on. Um, to people, whether it's people watching it for the first time and and you know going back and following along, whether it's people watching for the first time in a long time, every week we get stories about how much the show means to people, yes. and it's it's incredible to reinvestigate the show that re that means not only so much to us but so much to so many people because of how much it defined television as we know it today. So. Yeah, be sure to check all that out. Uh, as we said, you know, we just finished at the time we're recording this talking about Hearts and Minds, episode 13, the big Boone Shannon episode, a very weird episode of Lost. <laughs> but yeah. spoiler alert, something that Josh and I surprisingly, I think, liked more than your traditional uh, Lost popular opinion. So uh, we, we really get into it and we have... 12 episode plus episodes in the backlog if you want to start from the beginning uh you have like 39 hours to yeah to yeah I, you know they say uh 
uh, even bad pizza, you know, is still good pizza because it's pizza. Like I, I don't know that that's necessarily true. I've had some pretty awful pizza, but I, <laughs> uh, but I, I think I, I think even my least favorite episode of Lost, I would be able to find merit in. Uh, yeah, like right. I, I don't think that there is a single episode of Lost that I would be like, forget that hard thumbs down all the way to the bottom of the ground. Uh, maybe, maybe close to it on one or two. Uh, <laughs> but, but. For, for the most part, every single one, like we'll be able to find something that we really enjoy. Uh, so we've been having a blast going through it, especially as you just have experienced again, Jack, like yeah. season one, as Arst found out firsthand is dynamite. Yeah. <laughs> you got to uh, handle you, it gingerly. Yeah. You're talking about the Shannon, the, the uh, Shannon Boone episode. That's where I got my uh, Shannon was pregnant with uh, Boone's baby. Oh yeah. Oh my Ooh, God. The Boone B. <laughs> yeah. Yes. But we never got it because she got shot. By right. Aunt, spoiler alert, Anna Lucia and killed it. Maybe, uh, yeah. I'm glad, I know we've been trying to get together for a, a while now, and it's it's again. I can't say how much is how much. How Thanks enjoyable. for having us. This yes, hey, great. Yeah, well, such a blast. Anytime. I can't, I can't believe it's been an hour, and a, hour and a half already. Just flowed. Let us let us know. We'll be back for sure. Whenever you want us. All right. Sounds good. All right. Cool. Bye, everybody. Bye, guys. Bye. <laughs>